We're going to be in James 5. If you were here last week, Emily did a phenomenal job looking at James 5, the first six verses of how James speaks to the ungodly wealthy that were in the community. It was actually a scorching word for the wealthy. It was very strong. It was harsh. It was blunt. In fact, in the first six verses of James 5, James, get on the arrogant, James gets on the arrogant rich about them hoarding their possessions. They're ignoring the needs of those around them. In fact, it actually gets worse than that. James says, hey, you refuse to pay the people that work for you. They're using their wealth in ungodly ways, and James just unleashes on them. He says, hey, listen, their cries, God hears it, and God is going to respond. It's very similar to, if you think about it, Exodus, when the people are crying out because of the oppression that they were facing. James says, God hears the cries of those who have been oppressed. And I, as we look at this t- week's text, I say all of that because this week's text is a continuation of last week's conversation. The first 12 verses of James 5 are actually two sides of the same coin. Last week, James addresses these Um, ungodly, self-indulgent, rich. And today, he's going to talk about the other side of the coin. He's going to talk about, what about those who've gotten the short end of the stick? What about you who haven't been parried right? What about you who life hasn't gone well for you? What about you who've been mistreated and oppressed and you struggle? When the congregation was reading James's letter, there was probably people in the church saying, I'm so glad James is beating up on the wealthy, but what about me? What about the things that I am going through right now? James, do you see what I am experiencing? Yes, it's great for you to criticize them, but what about me? Do you see what's going on? But even worse than that, does, even more important, does God see what's going on? Does God see my struggle? Does God see the hardship? And does God care about what I'm going through? There's a theological, political movement that has picked up some steam over the last 40, 50 years. It's more prevalent in liberal denominations. It's called liberation theology. And the premise of liberation theology is basically this, that God is on the side of the oppressed. That's great. And that God, because God is on the side of the oppressed, the oppressed need to rise up and claim their inheritance. They need to take back what was stolen from them. And they need to do that through protest or maybe even use violence as a mean necessary to get back what they have, what they were taken from them. And after reading the first six verses of James 5, I don't know if you were ready to take arms, but those feelings rise up inside of you about wanting to stand up against evil men and women who are, take advantage of people. You have the ungodly rich living in indulgence, and the reason they're so wealthy is because they refuse to pay the people that work for them. And James says that the cries of the oppressed have reached the ears of God. And surely you read something like that, and you think that God's response is going to be, let's bring judgment on these people, and who else, who else is better to bring judgment on these people than those who have been oppressed? In other words, enough is enough. Let's rise up and say, we're not taking this anymore. It's time to even the score, even if we have to revolt to do it. The only problem is, when we read this morning's text, we realize that that's not God's solution at all. So what is God's solution? And that's exactly what James addresses in these few verses in James 5. And James says, this is what our response should be. In fact, maybe you're here this morning and you're in the middle of a really difficult situation in your own life right now. Maybe you're here and you're thinking, Man, I understand what it means to say enough is enough. I understand what it means to say I've had it up to here with all of the suffering and challenges and problems and all these things that are going wrong in my life. Anybody been there? Anybody there now? And what are we supposed to do? Well, you're supposed to, well, you need James 5 this morning. Let me read our text, James 5, verses 7 through verse 12. It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, Be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and the latter rains. You also must be patient. 
Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. Brothers, sisters, do not complain to each other so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. Brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as a living example of patience and suffering. See, we count as blessed those who have endured. You've heard of Job's endurance, and you've seen the outcome of what the Lord brought about. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. Above all, brothers, sisters, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. Let your yes mean yes and your no mean no so that you don't have fall under judgment. We've got another challenging passage this week, don't we? But it's a passage that we need to hear and we need to heed and we need to obey because like the ones who were hurting in James's day, you and I have to deal with the fact that sometimes life just isn't fair. Life isn't fair. It isn't. In fact, sometimes it's brutally painful and unfair. We're not home yet, which means we're still living in a fallen, jacked up, messed up world. And because of that, trials, big and small, are an inevitable part of our lives. Jesus himself prepared for us in his teachings. He said in John, he said, in this world, you will have problems. In this world, you will have suffering. And Paul takes it a step further, and he says that sometimes you're going to experience trouble and hardship for no other reason other than the fact that you are simply a child of God. That simply because you follow Jesus, you go through hardships and difficulties. He said in 2 Timothy 3 that all of us who desire to live a godly life in Jesus, we will be persecuted. You say, but that's not fair. I agree with you. It's not fair. But Christian, it's true. It's true. So what do we do? How do we respond when to the unfair troubles and trials of life? And James gives us two responsibilities, two things that we are supposed to do, and they both begin with the letter P. I love alliteration, and, but James made it really easy for me. I didn't even have to think of stuff this week. And he says two things that start with the letter P, and he says you need to be patient and you need to persevere. Be patient and persevere. And before you check out saying you've got the two points, we need to explain what these two things are. The first one is be patient. Let's look at this. Verse 7 says, brothers, sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. Verse 8, you must be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. And I need to take a second to explain what patience means in the original language. In other words, when James wrote this, what did the readers hear? That word patience is actually a compound Greek word. The idea is being long, enduring, or long, tempered. I'll give you an example. In 2 Peter 3, Peter says that God is called patient. Literally, God is long, enduring toward us, not wanting any one of us to perish, but for all of us to come to repentance. It suggests the idea of self-restraint, of self-control, of keeping it together instead of losing your cool. James translates this Greek word as long-suffering. And that's a great translation because patience enables us to suffer unfairly for a long time without striking back. It enables us to endure the fact that life is not fair without drifting into carnal, unchristlike responses. I don't know about you, but I need that kind of patience. And I need that kind of patience often. I want you to notice how James applies it. That if we're going to endure the unfairness of life, not only do you need to be patient, but you need to get, he actually gets more specific here. He says you need to apply this patience in two primary areas of your life. First of all, you need to be patient with God. You need to be patient with God. Verse 7, notice we need to be patient. How long? Until the Lord returns. In fact, James alludes in these three verses, 7, 8, and 9, he alludes three times to the fact that Jesus is coming back. So this is something he wants us to get, that Jesus is coming back. When it comes to everything that's wrong or unfair in this present world, we're talking about problems and prejudices and persecutions, you name it, all of these things that are wrong will not be made completely right until the King of Righteousness comes back in his glory. 
We will always endure persecutions or problems. In fact, while I'm on the subject, can I remind you that Jesus is coming back? He's coming back. His second coming is mentioned over 300 times in the New Testament alone. And he says that he's going to, one of the things that he's going to do when he comes back is he's going to take everything that is wrong and he's going to make it right. You get to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and there's this really, really cool verse, especially if you like Ultimate Fighting or WWE. This is a verse for you. It says that Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back with a sword in his mouth, and he is going to make everything right, and evil is going to be gone. Right? You can picture Hulk Hogan walking out, and like everyone cheers and excited, right? That's what Jesus is going to do. He's going to destroy it. He's going to destroy evil for good. I love how Paul expresses it to the men of Athens in Acts 17. Listen to these words. He says, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people to repentance, because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man that he has appointed. He has provided proof to this to everyone by raising him from the dead. The day's coming, friends, and I'll be honest, the older I get and the more of life's experiences I get, the more injustices I see, the more suffering I see, there's a yearning that says what the Apostle John says in Revelation, Jesus, come quickly, come quickly. Would you make things right? Would you put an end to suffering? Would you put an end to pain? Would you put an end to hardship? Jesus, come quickly. I can identify with a story of this famous pastor by the name of Philip Brooks. And the story is told that one day he's in church and he's just pacing back and forth like a caged lion, just pacing in anxiety. And one of his associates came to him and noticed him and said, hey, what's wrong, Dr. Brooks? And Dr. Brooks looks at him and says, what's wrong? What's wrong is this? I'm in a hurry, and apparently God is not. You ever feel like that? Like, God, do this, do this now? And God says, you know what? Be patient. You're going to wait for a while. Have you ever wanted God to hurry up and intervene, and God, do something in my circumstances, or do something in the life of someone I love, love, and you pray, and you pray, and you pray, and then you pray some more, and nothing changes. Listen carefully, when the time like that will come, and they will come, we need to be patient and we need to trust God's perspective and God's timing. See, God sees every bit of our life from our first breath to our last breath at the same time because God is outside of time. There is no past, present, or future with God. He sees it all like right now. That's why he says, I am. Not I was or I will be, I am. I am. So he knows what's ahead. He knows our needs better than we do. The other thing we need to remember is that in Jesus, because of the gospel, he loves us more than we can imagine. And because of that, we need to learn to trust in his love. And I think that's what James is saying in this passage. Believing that he is going to allow any unfairness to come our way or any trial or tribulation or anything that is somehow not connected to our good and for his glory. That even in those moments when we say, God, I don't understand this, but I trust it's for my good and your glory. Romans 8 reminds me continually that God is causing everything, all things, to work together for good. He's using it to help me and you become more and more like Jesus. Often, adversity is a much more effective teacher than good times. It's in those moments of adversity that you really learn to trust God. Jerry Bridges says it so well. If God's love is sufficient for my greatest need, which is salvation from hell, surely it's sufficient for my lesser needs the adversities that I encounter in my daily life. Is that not true? And so in tough times, we need to be reminded of verses like Psalm 27, where it says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. He says it twice. It's got to be important. Wait for God. 
Wait for him. In his book, Sabbatical Journey, Henry Nowen writes about some friends who happen to be trapeze artists in the circus. And they explained to Nowen that there was a special relationship between the flyer and the catcher. The flyer is the guy or girl that lets go and goes flying through the air, and the catcher is the guy or girl on the other end that's supposed to catch him. As you can imagine, that relationship is very, very important, especially to the flyer. And the flyer is swinging up high above the crowd. There comes a moment when it's the flyer's job simply to let go, to fly. And in that moment, they arch out into the air, and they begin to fly. And they are to remain as still as possible, and they are to wait for the strong hands of the catcher to literally grab them out of the air. And the trapeze artist underscored the point to now when he said, the flyer must never try to catch the catcher. If you do that, you'll end up on the net and fall. The flyer just has to be caught. So there's not a person in this room that has experienced times in life where it felt like we were literally flying. And we have no idea where we're going to fall, but not in a good way. There was no parachute. There was no net below flying, wondering why God is taking so long. And in those moments, it's really tempting to take things into our own hands. But like the trapeze artist, James is saying that it's critical that we trust the catcher. It's trust critical that we trust Jesus. This is why we can say with the psalmist, I am trusting you, O God, saying you are my God. My future is in your hands. You're my God. The reason we can say that is because we have his promise. I want you to look at, listen to Luke chapter 18 where Jesus says that God will give what is right to his people who cry to him day or night and he will not be slow to answer them. Friends, I didn't say that. Jesus did. Jesus makes that promise, that he will not be slow to answer you. God is faithful. So we need to practice patience in our relationship with the Lord. And then James mentions another area of application. Not only do we need to be patient with God, but we also need to be patient with each other. Verse 9, brothers, sisters, don't complain about one another. Because if you do, you'll be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. Why did James write that? Because there were some Christians that were in this church and they were facing so much pressure on the outside. And because of their unfair persecution, they were grumbling and they were complaining and were led to believe that they even started making false promises to one another. We get that in verse 12. James says, don't make an oath. Don't make promises. Don't say, let your yes be yes, your no be no. Don't curse each other. And he's not talking about the idea of hey, you're just cursing each other out. That's not the kind of swearing that James is talking about in verse 12. He's not talking about profanity. He's talking about the idea of swearing by an oath. Similar to phrases you hear today like, I swear to God, or I swear on my mother's tomb, or um, so on. I put my hand on the Bible and I swear to you that I'm telling the truth, right? It's, they're giving their word, but they're not keeping it. And what was happening was they were being mistreated. And because they were being mistreated, they ended up starting to mistreat each other. Pressures on the outside began to lead to problems on the inside. And so James addresses it and says, you have to be careful of that. I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room that's ever had a bad day at work. And you come home, and you, you're patient at work. You're taking it all in, and you're enduring. and you come home and all of a sudden there's toys everywhere or uh, your wife says something and you just snap, right? All of a sudden you unload. That's the imagery here. I'm sure none of you ever had that experience, just me. But um, that's what James is saying. Is like, you're enduring, you're suffering, but be careful of how you treat each other. Be careful on how your relationship with each other. But there's, there's even more to that. James 4, verse 6, that... James makes the statement that God gives us greater grace. He does. He gives greater grace. I love that one line, maybe more than any other line in the book of James, that God gives us greater 
grace. And he says that right after he says these words, that friendship with the world is hostility toward God. In other words, you can't be a friend with the world and be a friend of God. And this is one of those times where James is saying it's either all or nothing with God. You have to be fully committed to God or you're not fully committed at all. It's either all world or all God. It can't be both. And so the standard is unbelievably high. And the truth is, I don't meet that standard. And neither do you. And God responds to us and he says, the answer is that I'm going to give you greater grace. I'm going to give you greater grace. You see that? He gives a greater grace that's even greater than the demands that he makes of us. It's amazing. He meets our failures with greater grace. Or to use the language of Paul in Romans 5, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. That when you feel like failing, God's grace comes to you in an even greater way. Here's the point. When you and I extend the same grace and understanding to one another, that's what the Bible calls patience. (coughs) That's what the Bible means when it uses the word patience. James is saying that we need to learn to be patient with each other as God is patient with us. So let me stop for a moment and think about this question. How patient has God been with you? How patient has God been with you? I'll tell you how patient. The Bible says that he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. He doesn't repay us according to our iniquities. Here's why Psalm 103, by the way, this is a really, really good verse if you're an impatient person. You should memorize this. Listen to this. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger, abounding in faithful love. So can every description there. God is compassionate. Has he been compassionate to you? God is is gracious. Has he been gracious to you? God is slow to anger. Are you still alive? He should have struck you dead the moment you sinned the first time. He is slow to anger. God is abounding in love. Have you experienced his love? And God wants us as his children to abound in these things as well. That's what's James is saying, (coughs) so if you have a hard time being patient with people, meditate on this verse. I say this because you can't give away what you don't have. Legalism will get up here and say, you just need to be patient. You just need to stop being so impatient. That's not helping. No, you need to realize how loved you are. And then you need to become secure in that. God's got you in the palm of his hand. Yeah, but I have all of these struggles and I have all of these problems and this isn't going right and that isn't going right. And here, God, this morning, I have you in my hand and I have you covered and I am compassionate towards you and I am gracious towards you and I am slow to anger towards you and I am abounding in my love towards you and I look at you through the blood of Jesus and we begin to realize as we meditate on that just how loved we are and it changes us and all of a sudden those things that God is pouring into us we are able to pour out into the people around us. Being kind is not simply a command that's told. You're kind because God has been kind to you. You love because God loved you. See, for a Christian, for a follower of Jesus, how we live in this world is a response to how God has treated us. And so if you're mean and you're obnoxious and if you're always rude to people, can I, as nicely as I can, say you you haven't experienced the love of Jesus? or you haven't let it soak in to your life. Because the more you soak into the fact of what God has done in you, it becomes evident through you. Responsibility number one is patience. Patience with God, trusting that he will work in his timing, and then patience with each other. The second thing, 
is perseverance. Really quickly. Notice the other responsibility that James mentions is our need to persevere. Verse 11, some of your translations will say, be steadfast or endure or persevere. And what's the difference between patience and endurance or perseverance? What's the difference between those two words? Really good question. They're actually really closely related, and I'm going to paint a really broad brush here. Generally speaking, the word patience is used in reference to other people. The word endurance is used to circumstances or situations that you're going through, especially difficult and challenging circumstances. The word means to remain under, to hang in there, to stay with it, to stick it out, to endure, to persevere, to dig in, to keep going. To, it's summed up in this statement, tough times never last, but tough people do. You know, if you want to test, is that me? If you want to test the strength of a man or a woman, and you want to test their character, see what it takes to discourage them. See what it takes to discourage them. How easily are you discouraged? How easily are you frustrated? How easily do you get to the point where you say, you know what, I'm done. I'm quitting. I'm moving on. I'm just giving up. What does it take to discourage you? That's what James is talking about here, patient endurance. Who are the blessed ones in verse 11? The ones who have endured, the ones who persevere, the ones who remain steadfast. Be patient in trusting God and in dealing with other people and persevere. And to illustrate that, James gives us three examples in our text, three things that he talks about. He talks about the farmer, he talks about prophets, and he talks about this man named Job. I want to really quickly look at these three characters, and I want to give you an application from each of their lives. Verse 7 says, the farmer, brothers, sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and the latter rains. What does farmer, farming and patience have in common? Everything, right? I mean, like absolutely everything. If you are an impatient person, don't become a farmer. Don't plant any seeds in your backyard because it will drive you nuts. If you're a type A personality, farming isn't for you. Farmers have to be patient. You've got to be patient on the seed. You've got to be patient when it comes to the weather. You plant and you wait, and then you wait. And by the way, you wait some more. You wait for the early rains to soften the grounds. You wait for the seeds to sprout. You wait for the latter rains to produce growth. You keep waiting until it's time for harvest. And in those process, you can't control the weather. There's no way that you're going to be able to speed up the process. And while there's certainly work that you need to do, like weeding and fertilizing and cultivating, every farmer knows that the harvest and its timing is ultimately in the hands of God. So you plant, and you wait, and you trust. And James really isn't talking about farming here in this passage at all. He's talking about life. This wasn't written to the local garden club. This was written to people that were suffering. His point is that the sufferer, like the farmer, sometimes needs to patiently wait. You face circumstances sometimes that are beyond your control, and there's nothing more that you can do other than to wait. And once we've done all that we can do, James says that, hey, listen, grumbling isn't going to help, and complaining isn't going to help, and moping around is going to, isn't going to help, and bickering is going to help, swearing to each other isn't going to help. You need to wait, and you need to put your trust in God. You need to trust God. Here's the first principle, first application. Some suffering is beyond our control. We need to patiently trust God. Some suffering is beyond our control. We need to patiently trust God. I so wish there was more than that. Right? I wish there was answers and solutions. I wish I could look at some of you guys this morning and through look at some of the hard things you're going through and say, here's what God is doing in your life. But I have no idea what God is doing in your life. I remember a conversation I was having with a group of men. And one of the guys asked us, hey, what's God doing in each of your lives right now? And one of the men in that circle responded, in the most profound way that has still left an impression on me. 
He said, what's God doing in my life right now? Ask me 10 years from now. Then I'll know what God is doing right now. What God is doing right now, you have no idea. But you just patiently trust God. Psalms 119 says, your word is a lamp unto my feet. That lamp doesn't light all the way up there. It lights one step ahead of you. You see what's ahead, you take a step. You see what's the next step, you take another step. You see what's ahead, you take another step. Pretty soon you look back, you're not where you used to be. You didn't even realize where you are because all you were doing was taking one step at a time, just trusting, patiently waiting on Jesus. See, some of you want to know what God is doing in your life, and God says, no, just, you see that light in front of you? Take that step. You see that light in front of you? Take that next step. I'll take care of the details of your life, but you take that next step. Listen, that's not easy, is it? Sometimes you want to know what the answer is right now. I was sitting this week thinking, last week I was officiating a wedding, and it was a fun wedding because it was two people I loved dearly, but they were part of the church that I used to be a part of. And if you know our story, some of you have heard our story, we went through a very hard experience at the previous church. There were people that destroyed our names. They started walking around saying that Sam was preaching Mormonism and Jehovah Witness theology and Calvinism. Now you can put all three of that together. That's just simply profound to me. That's a mystery. Um, and they tarnished our names. They beat us up. We left thinking that ministry was done, that God would never use us, that we would never do ministry anymore. Right? And it was one of the worst, hardest experiences of my life because I was like, God, I went to seminary for you. I went to serve you. I went to follow you. And this is what I experience? And here I am 10 years later, looking back and saying, man, if I didn't go through that, I wouldn't be standing here with you guys this morning. Right? If sometimes when you're going through it, it makes no sense. But God knows. God knows exactly what he's doing because he is outside of time. He doesn't just see that second. He sees where you are 10 years later. He sees where you are 20 years later. Some of you right now are going through stuff in your life, and you're like, God, what are you doing? God says, be patient. Trust me. I remember two years after, when we started this, we were started as a Bible study. And we had 150 or 200 kids, uh, college students. I keep calling you guys kids. You guys are older than kids. Um, coming to Bible study. And it was just so much fun. And we're like, oh, man, God's doing something here. Let's start a church. And you could ask Roy and Charles. I was the last one wanting to start a church because I was still burned out from our previous experience. And, and everyone's like, hey, we're not a Bible study anymore. God is bringing people to faith. We need to be a church. And we're like, all right, fine. And begrudgingly, we agreed. This place opened up. We're like, all right, well, all these people are going to join us. This place is going to be packed out really fast. And so we're going to be excited. And we got excited. We did all the renovations in here. We did launch service. This place was packed. Week two, there was 20 people in here. Week three, there was 20 people in here. There was one week, I had two people on this side, three people on this side. And I was like, God, I missed you. I totally missed your voice. I failed. And God said, be patient. And we kept communicating, hey, we want to be a church that reaches our city. We want to be a people that loves our city, loves our city well. And all I had was 20 Indians. I was like, how are we going to be a multi-ethnic city, multi-ethnic church with 20 Indians who've never evangelized because they grew up in churches that grew because of immigration? And God said, be patient. Look around. Look around. You might go through some stuff right now, and you have no idea what you're going through, but your life is in the palm of his hands. And he knows your future, just as much as he, you know your present, if not better. You need to be able to trust God. I have totally gone off topic there. Uh, but you need to be able to trust God. You might not have any control over what's going on in your life right now. But listen, God does. He does. All right, let me get find where I'm at. Where do you need patience today? What are you facing right now in your life that is out of your control? Maybe it's work-related or school-related or child-related or spouse-related or finance-related or health-related. You have no idea where the answer is coming from. What do you do? 
you patiently trust God. Nothing is beyond his power, his purpose for our lives, and nothing is greater than Jesus. So trust him. And that leads to the second example. It's the Old Testament prophets. Verse 10, brothers, sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. He doesn't mention any prophet in particular, but notice he refers to them as those who spoke in the name of the Lord, meaning these are people who chose to obey Jesus and follow Jesus, and yet because of their obedience to Jesus, they were suffering. These are men, who, women who got up and said, this is what God is saying. And listen, these men and women who were obedient to Jesus were not exempt from suffering. Can I tell you about a few of them? There was a man named Ezekiel. Day or a few days before he's supposed to get up and preach in front of a crowd and tell them what God is supposed to say to them, his wife dies. Daniel was deported and lived in a foreign land as a hostage. Hosea, this one is really, really good. God says, hey, this woman right there, marry her. And Hosea's like, but God, she's a hooker. And God says, marry her. And he does. And they have kids. And she goes back to prostitution. And God says, go get her. And he says, okay. And she keeps running back and forth into prostitution. Elijah. Any of you ever suffer from depression? Elijah suffered from severe depression. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet because his own people beat him and put him in prisons and cisterns because he was saying what God told him to say. Listen, you can be right smack in the middle of God's will for your life and still suffer. You can do exactly what God is telling you to do and life won't be fair. What happens when we find ourselves in the middle of suffering? Often what we do is we say, Oh God, why am I being punished? Oh God, what am I doing wrong? God, why are you angry at me? Why are you doing this? The prophet spoke on behalf of God's voice and they suffered. Here's the second principle. Most suffering is not a punishment for sin. Trust God and bloom where he has placed you. Listen, not all suffering is a punishment or a discipline for sin. Some might be, Jonah, but not all. So instead of saying, God, I don't understand, what have I done wrong? Could it be that God says, listen, I have you right where I want you. Be faithful, bloom where I've placed you. I mentioned Jeremiah, but I want you to listen to a passage from Jeremiah 29. This is directed toward a people of God that has been carried away into exile. These people are looking at God and they're praying to God and they're saying, God, give us deliverance, give us freedom, help us get out of this. They're repenting, they're surrendering, and they're saying, deliver us from Babylon. And here's what God tells them. <coughs> Jeremiah 29, this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says to you exiles that I deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. Here's what I want you to do. Build houses and live in them. You're going to be here for a while, guys. Make some homes. Get settled. Plant gardens, eat their produce, find wives for yourselves, have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters to men in marriage so that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Don't decrease. Pursue the well-being of the city that I have deported you to. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. For what? Pray that for the people that I have taken that have taken you into captivity. Pray on their behalf because when they thrive, you will thrive. You see what God was telling the Israelites? Like, listen, I know that Babylon isn't where you want to be. I know that this is not your ideal situation. I know you want to be a free people. I know you want to be in Jerusalem. I know you want to be back home and I know you miss your family and friends back home. But listen, I have you here right now. Be faithful, bloom. Let me work in you. There may be some of you this morning that this is hitting you right between the eyes because you're not where you hope to be. You're not where you thought you would be at this stage of your life. And so there's this discontented striving all the time. Maybe you don't have the job that you thought you would have by now. 
but you can't change your circumstances, what do you do? You trust God and you bloom where you've been planted. If you're a job, if you're at a job and you hate it, can I encourage you that if God wanted you at a different job, he would put you at a different job, but he has you there, so would you be faithful and bloom where he's placed you? And trust that if God wants you somewhere else, he'll take you somewhere else. But stay faithful to Jesus where you are right now. That's going to take a lot of patience. And that's why James gives us one more final example. And he gives us an example in a person named Job. Maybe you're familiar with him. James played in the Super Bowl of suffering, and he won. He was the wealthiest man that ever lived. He had everything going for him, and in a two-day period, all of it's gone. Everything is gone. He's bankrupt. His children get killed. He gets an incurable disease, and it's really, really painful. Job had a rough day. He was suffering. He lost his family, his friends, his finances. He's suffering mentally, physically, spiritually. In fact, when you think that things can't get worse, one day the love of his life comes to him and says, you might as just well curse God and die. Just end it. So God takes everything away from him except a nagging wife. That's where Job is at. And the worst part of Job's suffering, if you study Job's life, Job has no idea why. You and I know because we read the scriptures and we know what happened in heaven, but he doesn't know that. You read Job and you read the first 37 chapters of God not saying anything to Job. Job doesn't know. It just happened. There's no apparent reason at all. If there's anyone that should have said, why God, why me, it was Job. You say, life is not fair. I agree, it's not. God never said it would be fair. A lot of things in life defy explanation. In fact, we may never understand everything on this side of eternity. Job didn't understand. But if you read Job, you know that despite everything that happened to him, ultimately he never lost his faith in God. He continues to persevere. Now, there were times when Job was at his wit's end and he pushed back against God. There were. And he got some really pointed answers from God as well. You really think, who are you to question me? Do you really know who I am? Do you, are you sovereign like me? And eventually he gets to the point where Job simply declares, he says, I love this. God, even if you slay me, yet I will trust you. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken, and when it's all said and done, blessed be the name of the Lord. Look back at verse 11 of James 5. James points out at the end, what did God do? God blessed Job. Verse 11 says, you heard of Job's perseverance and seen what God has brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Again, if you study Job, you know that God blessed him twice as much in the end than he did in the beginning. He had 7,000 sheep in the, that he lost. At the end of his life, God gives him 14,000 sheep. 3,000 camels that were lost, God blesses him with 6,000 sheep, camels. He had 5,000 oxen that were lost. At the end, God gives him 1,000. Job had 10 children. He lost them all. Do you know what God did at the end of his life? He gave him 10 more. You say, well, why didn't God give him 20? Because verse 11 says that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. I've been waiting all morning just to get to that point. <laughs> it's funny, but it's not true, right? You know why he didn't give him 10 more? Because he never lost the first 10. He was going to be reunited with them in heaven one day. Here's the point. Even though Job endured incredible suffering, he persevered and God richly blessed him. Let me give you the final principle, and this might be the most difficult of them all. All suffering is temporary. So we need to keep trusting God and anticipate what's coming. The reward, the blessing, the words, well done, good and faithful servant. I didn't plan the scripture readings that were read this morning. Guys, if you have the scripture reading that was read this morning from Romans 8, but I read the exact same passage when I woke up this morning, open scripture. Um, but verse 16 and 17 of Romans 8 
just really love how God works sometimes. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children heirs and co-heirs with Jesus, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may be glorified with him. Sometimes the suffering just doesn't go away. It just doesn't. Not in the way that we want it to go away. And Paul's answer is that in those times that it doesn't even compare to the glory that's coming. I read a story this week as I was preparing. There's many, many versions of this story, but this week I read the story of a pastor by the name of Glenn Wheeler, whose wife passed away unexpectedly, and it left him in complete shock. Sometime much later, he wrote an article in Leadership Journal, and in it, he shared lessons that he learned about his wife's death and the things that God had taught him um, and the relationship with his wife. And one of the things that he said in the article, he said, man, I miss her a lot. But it's not the big things that I miss the most. He missed the moments where after service, where they would leave the church, and there was just the two of them, and she would slip his ha her hand into his hand, and they would walk to their cars, and she would look at him and say, you're a good man, Glenn Wheeler. You're a good man. He continued, I miss her cooking and the wonderful meals that she made, and she was a great, great cook. And the favorite part was when we were done eating, she would gather our plates and grab her all the stuff and clear the plates, and she would tell me, keep the fork, Glenn. Keep the fork. I used to love hearing her say that because I knew what she meant when she said, keep the fork. It meant that dessert was on its way, and I, if I told you how much my wife, how great a cook my wife was, and now I'm at a restaurant and I'm eating, and I really wish I could hear her say one more time, keep the fork, Glenn. And he said this at the end of the article. He said, there are times where I lay my head on the pillow, and I'm lonely and alone, and I could hear almost God saying, keep the fork, Glenn. Be patient, Glenn. Endure, Glenn. Keep going, Glenn. Because the best is yet to come. Can I encourage you this morning that no matter what you're going through, keep the fork. The best is yet to come. For a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus, life in this world can be incredibly painful at times. But rest assured, this is as close to hell as you will ever get. But if you are not a follower of Jesus in this room, enjoy all of life's pleasures, all that you can, because this is all you're ever going to get. This is the closest to heaven you'll ever get. As we come to communion, I want to remind you of what the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, he says, It pleased the Lord to crush him to crush you. It pleased the Lord to crush his son. In a moment, we're going to be taking communion like we do every Sunday. We're going to come and grab the elements that remind us that it pleased the Lord to crush the son. We're going to take the bread. We're going to take the juice. thinking about this this week, this juice, good old Welch's grape juice. The cup is supposed to be wine, but we have grape juice. But do you know how you get grape juice? A bunch of grapes need to be crushed. It needs to be smashed. And out of that comes juice. So every Sunday we respond to communion. We eat bread. We take juice. We're literally and spiritually participating in this awesome reminder that it pleased the Father to crush the Son. Not just that. But for us, the other thing that has to be true for us to be able to share 
in the Jews as part of communion, they took a lot of grapes. All this juice didn't come from one grape. It was a lot of grapes. One little grape wouldn't produce this much. So it speaks a message to us that we come to the table, we don't come alone. You're not alone. That together we are being pressed together by the Spirit of God so that what comes out of us is something awesome. If you're being pressed today, if you're being crushed today, would you trust him in the middle of that? Because what he will produce is going to be something incredibly tasty. I love this juice much more than I love that piece of plastic. It's because this took a lot of work. There was some crushing that involved. If you would just simply trust God, what God will produce from you is going to, and through you is going to be something incredibly beautiful. As you come to communion this morning, some of you need to just repent. Repent simply because you don't trust God. Repent simply because you've been bickering and complaining instead of saying, God, I trust you. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts a lot, but God, help me to trust you. Help me to believe in you. Help me to know that you are in control of my life. 